While we're having our virtual participants join us today, just want to thank you all for joining us. This is the final in our series. Um, we've been doing this for a few months now, um, and it was all revolving around a book called 10 Years In, Implementing Strategic Approaches to Cyberspace, um, which featured authors from Cyber Command, as well as academic authors, all looking at the implementation of strategy and really the 2018 uh, cyberspace strategy. But here we are today, um, three years later. Now we're really, really, really fortunate um, today to have with us in our final discussions some extraordinary panelists. Uh, so we have David Sanger. David Sanger is a journalist at the New York Times, but he's also author of The Perfect Weapon, which I have here. We also have with us today, Dimitri Alpro, Al, Alparvich. I feel horrible, I'm horrible with them for the pronunciation. Now he's the co-founder and chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, but before that was the co-founder and former CTO of CrowdStrike. So really, really thrilled to have our participants today. Um, so over the last few iterations of this discussion, um, we really looked at the development of strategy from, you know, the early days in the 2000s when the DOD was thinking about cyber strategy as this thing that fell under strategic command all the way up until today, uh, or really 2018, where you saw this new cyberspace strategy that went from deterrence to this thing that they called defend forward, um, as well as a cyber command vision of persistent engagement. Um, and the book really looks at implementing that vision that cyber command had. But the book misses something really important. And that's why I'm really, really excited that David and Dimitri are here, because the book takes the assumptions that guided the 2018 strategy and it presents them not as something that needs to be debated, but as something that needs to be implemented. And so one of the primary assumptions that undergirds this 2018 Department of Defense cyberspace strategy is that the US can combat with adversaries in cyberspace and be more proactive in cyberspace beyond its own networks without the risk of escalation. And they introduced this concept of defend for it that is all based on this idea that they can, the US can, can do actions and not lead to problems in other domains. But I think that's really up for debate. And we didn't talk about it at all in the previous session. So I'm really, really excited to have, have you two with us today. Now I wanna start, um, I want to start by asking you kind of a broad framing question. So both of you have been staring at cyberspace for a long time and you've seen a real evolution, probably. I'm interested in kind of what you see about how the world in cyberspace and how the US interacts in cyberspace has changed over the last decade. And then I'm interested in kind of what you see as the biggest threat in this last, you know, as we move from, you know, early 2000s to today in cyberspace. Yeah, do you want to go first? You wrote a book why on Why don't I give this to Dimitri, the man who's been lost in cyberspace for so long that he's <laughs> like, only now with Silverado coming back down to earth. <laughs> All right, well, I, 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 I can give it a shot, although David literally just wrote the book on this, so. Um, uh, I feel like he's much more prepared to, to speak to, to the topic uh, immediately. But, you know, in the last 10 years, what we've seen is a really aggressive stance on the part of our primary four adversaries, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Um, this, I'll say off the top that despite all the dire predictions over the last two decades about concerns with uh, proliferation of cyber weapons and how many states are building that, none of that has truly come to pass. Um, um, and, and, and the reason for that is, of course, that uh, at the end of the day, geopolitics is what's driving cyber conflict. And the same threat actors that we face in the, in the physical domain are the, the, the ones that we are, are challenged by in the cyberspace as well. So uh, I've said this probably half a decade ago that we do not have a cyber problem. We have a Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea problem. What I mean by that is not that every single attack uh, 
is, is perpetrated by those nation states, but the vast majority of attacks are either perpetrated by those nation states or by criminal groups that are um, um, operating from within the borders of those nation states, either with consent of those countries or at a, at a minimum with those countries turning a blind eye to them. And what's been uh, really um, dangerous, I think, is, is the increasing recklessness with which um, these nation states have been conducting their operations. And um, the, re the reality is that uh, we're seeing attacks that are much more disruptive um, and in some cases destructive. Uh, we've seen attacks that have targeted um, OT networks uh, on, on a few occasions, such as the uh, Russian um, attack on the Saudi oil refinery uh, a few years ago that literally, if, if, if it had been successful, could have killed uh, probably a dozen people that were operating that refinery. So um, uh, really on behalf of all the adversaries, whether it's the Chinese that are doing the, right now um, this reckless attack on exchange servers, literally infecting um, every, every organization on, on the internet that has a vulnerable exchange server and leaving them open for further attacks by other actors, whether it's the North Koreans that have engaged in all kinds of nefarious activities over the last uh, really 15 years, uh, both from a disruptive perspective as well as uh, traditional cyber crimes, st uh, breaking into banks, uh, stealing tens of millions of dollars um, in, in both uh, traditional funds and cryptocurrency. And of course, Iran uh, conducting a variety of different disruptive attacks uh, as well as Russia. So um, things have gotten a lot worse from an adversary perspective. And the US, I still, I think, still is trying to figure out how do we come to terms with this and how do we respond? And uh, we've moved from a strategic perspective beyond this idea that we have to respond to cyber and cyber. Um, that was our articulation of the 2010 DOD strategy uh, back in the Obama administration. Uh, but we're still trying to figure out what does that actually mean and what tools do we have in the physical space um, that we can bring to bear on those actors to actually change their behavior. It's very, very easy for us to go into our sanctions toolkit and, and implement sanctions, at least against Russia, um, Iran, and North Korea, a little bit harder against China, given the economic interdependence. Uh, but those have really not moved the needle at all um, in changing their behavior, frankly, either um, on, on traditional geopolitical challenges we face with those countries and certainly not on cyber. And uh, we've uh, so far not been super creative about what else we can do to them um, to get them to stop. There have been obviously reports of a few cyber operations we've done against internet research agency and the like um, to, to try to um, sort of slow down the pace of the operations, make it a little bit more difficult. But even that um, I think uh, has, has not been truly strategically successful at changing their behavior. Well, I would agree with uh, everything that Dimitri said. This is more about geopolitics first and cyber second. Uh, I would uh, agree that we've seen the pace of these operations take off, not just for state-sponsored activity, but ransomware shows you for criminal activity and for the sort of um, fuzzy uh, space between those two of uh, criminal groups that may be working on behalf of states and so forth were allowed to work. Um, I certainly agree that we've had hesitant uh, and changing uh, US responses. Um, but I think we've seen a couple of other features to this as well. Um, the first is that 10 years ago, I think people regarded cyber conflict as something to the side. You know, there's traditional military activity, traditional competition, and then this, which is very similar to what happened in World War I when we rolled out airplanes for the first time. And um, I keep a... a book uh, on my uh, uh, library shelves here that was published around 1910 or 1911 called Aeroplanes in Peace and War. And uh, it was published in Britain and, you know, it asked, had a chapter on the question, um, uh, could uh, London ever be attacked by air? Um, that was answered uh, uh, relatively quickly after the book was published uh, and, and so forth. And even at the end of World War I, 
people were still thinking of air power as something separate because while it, we had had examples of, uh, of conflict in the air uh, during World War I and we had um, uh, the Germans uh, rolling out their stuff and the Red Baron and all that, the war would have ended the same way and about the same time if we'd never had air power. I'm not sure you would have said that by World War II at which point what had been a tactical weapon got merged up with the atomic bomb and became a big part of the strategic weapon. And so the question I think now, as we head in a decade later is, are we about to go make that same shift? And I would argue that cyber has now moved from a sideshow to the main show because the main show is all about short of war conflict, right? No one wants to take on the US directly. And all of the players, as Dimitri rightly points out, have calibrated their attacks well enough not to trigger a traditional overwhelming military response. And that's what has so confounded American planners. And it runs all through your book, Jackie, I think. It, through here because we know how to respond if somebody shuts down the power grid from Boston to Washington or Seattle down to LA. That's a full on act of war. What we don't know how to respond to is something that is well short of war, but erodes bit by bit our power, our trust in our systems and so forth. And that's why I think solar winds and the Hafnium attack, the Microsoft Exchange attack are so fascinating because no matter what you think the ultimate goal was, whether it was espionage or putting in back doors or whatever, the Russians and the Chinese, assuming the attribution is, is correct here, have shown that they can get into our major platforms and affect those major platforms in ways that we may well not detect or that we may detect months late. And that actually undercuts your own confidence that you can trust your own systems. And that's what makes it destabilize, right? Because at the moment that you don't know that you can trust your systems to work, you begin to think about those things you might do preemptively so that you don't reach that point. That's a really great segue because your the assertion that you just made that the uncertainty about your vulnerability may lead to incentives for preemptive strike or deliberate escalation is the primary kind of the null hypothesis about how cyber operations may impact international stability. And we've seen this play out in discussions about cyber and nuclear weapons as well as cyber and conventional weapons. Um, it is such a disturbing problem that it's actually something that I, um, I tackle in my academic work. So I've been running a war game for the last um, two and a half, three years. I have a team of people that we've been working with, Ben Schechter and Rachel Schaefer, looking at exactly that issue. So we introduced a war game where we introduced in both a vulnerability, a cyber vulnerability and a cyber exploit into a nuclear command and control two kind of otherwise equal states are given, um, teams are given either the exploit or the vulnerability or both or none, it's an experimental game. And then our null hypothesis was that the teams that had that cyber vulnerability, and it was a really bad cyber vulnerability. It was actually, I mean, Dimitri would probably laugh. It's like not very likely to happen, actually. It's a worst case scenario. So we gave it to them in the thought that this is going to create the same kind of incentives that we worry about, and this will create incentives for deliberate escalation. And whether that deliberate escalation is to nuclear war or kind of more aggressive um, conventional campaigns. And we don't find that. So it's really fascinating. I've run this with 581 players over two and a half years, run it all over the world. And we actually find an opposite dynamic. Instead of the vulnerability creating incentives for deliberate escalation, what we find is that people tend to downplay the vulnerabilities. And I think we see this in normal day-to-day -day life. I mean, how many people just don't patch, right? Like cyber vulnerabilities are things that we, we just kind of dismiss. It's this kind of strange cognitive bias. But what we found was there was overconfidence in the use of the cyber exploit. And so teams that had the cyber exploit 
but not the vulnerability, were more likely to use counterforce campaigns. So it was interesting. It was not the worry about the vulnerability, but the overconfidence in their own capabilities that led to the more destabilizing incentives, which you know is really counterintuitive for us and it's something we're continuing to look at. But I say all this to preface, we need to have a discussion about escalation. So I am interested from both of your perspectives. I think, David, I think in, in your book, I hear heavy, um, heavy concerns about how cyber operations lead to escalation. Um, but I'm interested now, you know, from both of your perspectives, does the new DOD cyber strategy lead to the potential for more escalation? And what would that look like? What is escalation? Because we say this a lot, but we don't always agree on what that means. What is cyber escalation? Is it more likely today than it was three years ago? Um, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So, so the type of escalation I actually worry about is accidental escalation. I think a lot about um, the destructive attacks we have seen from Russia and North Korea in the past, like NotPetya attacks against Ukraine that spread uh, broader than just Ukraine, and, and the WannaCry attack that um, uh, from North Korea that was that was um, stopped early on. What if those had not been stopped, or uh, in the case of NotPetya, uh, had impacted much broader population of victims in the West? In the case of NotPetya, there were uh, some major victims, but at the end of the day, it was not a hugely destructive attack to the US economy. But what if it had been? Um, and in, in those particular situations, it was pretty clear that neither Russia nor North Korea actually had that as an end goal. But because of the recklessness with which they crafted both those attacks, it spread uncontrollably and, and impacted a lot more victims than um, they actually wanted. And in the case of Russia, actually impacted their own companies as well. Uh, but, but you can imagine a scenario where something like this that is not designed to be well contained um, spreads, causes dramatic impact um, across the board, huge economic damage. And um, then you sort of are faced with a choice, even though you were not the intended victim, you, you are suffering enormous um, uh, impact. So um, do you respond or do you not respond? And, and you can um, see how there's potential for escalation there. Um, I do not worry about the DOD strategy causing escalation. One, because uh, most people still don't understand what, 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 what the heck it means, right? So um, I, I think intentionally they're using euphemisms like persistent engagement and defend forward and hunt forward without actually explaining in detail um, what they mean by any of it. So you have people that are sort of writing their own interpretations of it um, and those that have not seen the classified strategies and, and operations don't actually um, uh, have a good view of um, what it is that DOD is or is not doing. So I think strategies in and of themselves are not inherently escalatory in the cyber domain. Operations are. And to this day, there is zero evidence that any of the operations that Cyber Command has conducted uh, have caused any escalatory behavior on the part of our adversaries. Uh, I think Dimitri's right. And you could then argue um, that we may have more latitude to respond to cyber incidents than we've given ourselves. If you think about the debate that took place in the Situation Room over the Sony hack, um, which I play out at some length with, after talking to as many of the participants as I could, could get to um, in The Perfect Weapon. Um, what you discover is there were a group of people saying, look, this is as close to an act of real destructive cyber aggression as you're gonna get. Forget making the emails public. We don't really care what Angelina Jolie is like to work with on the set pay attention to the fact that they destroyed 70% of Sony's computer systems, Sony Pictures Entertainment, right? And um, so that led President Obama at that point to be asking, well, this isn't cyber war. Is it cyber sabotage? Maybe, remember publicly he called it uh, a, an act of, uh, I think he called it cyber graffiti or something along those those lines. It was clearly more severe than that. And there were people within the NSA and cyber, the 
predecessor, Cyber Command, at, at that point, who argued that the US needed to respond more aggressively. And the fear was uncontrolled escalation. Came up again in the hack of the um, uh, Sands Casino, although I don't think anybody was willing at that time to go to war on behalf of Sheldon Adelson. Um, it came up again over OPM, but that was a case of pure espionage. And that debate is now playing out anew in the arguments which presumably we'll see some answers to in the next a week or two about how to go respond to solar winds. And I've heard Dimitri, and he can represent his position much better than I can, basically make the case, this isn't the one you want to go to general quarters for, right? And he can explain to you why that may be. But I do think there is one risk that we may be underestimating here. And that is, you tend to make hasty decisions and overreact when taken by surprise, right? When you don't see it coming, when you don't have time for debate, when there isn't a moment to sort of all sit down and figure out what it is you're going to do. And that's why I find what's most fascinating about solar winds, and then again about Haftium, is that the NSA missed it, right? That we learned about the first from FireEye, we learned about uh, the second one uh, through Microsoft and, uh, and some others who had been helping Microsoft out all in the private sector. And this has a lot of people in government pretty concerned because if you don't see it coming and then all of a sudden it's upon you, the urgency to act in response can be much higher. So uh -huh. I want to, uh, there's so much there that I want to Jump on, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go backwards a little bit and start talking about this. Um, Dimitri, you made a comment that I thought was really um, uh, really good, um, and it was that nobody really knew or does know what defend for it is. And this is something that I have critiqued the government for a lot. Was this is needlessly ambig needlessly ambiguous? Um, I'm not sure even your staff officers have the same idea about what defend for it is. And indeed. Um, I, I think especially when you look at 2018, you started seeing um, different perspectives on what included under Defend Forward. So you had a series of kind of public statements by people like Nakasone that were very careful about how they characterize Defend Forward. And it looks a lot more like intelligence, right? Um, but then you have the report by David in 2018 that suggests that the US is, is placing malware in the um, Russian critical infrastructure in their electrical infrastructure grid as a signaling campaign. So I, I think at that time in 2018, there was a really big internal argument stemming from that kind of um, going all the way back to Sony about whether cyber operations should be used primarily as a signaling mechanism or whether they should be used really just kind of as a counter cyber operation. So I, I'm interested from both of your perspectives about what is included under Defend Forward. Is, does Defend Forward include these kind of signaling operations? Um, does the government not know what it wants to do? Or has the government made a decision that Defend Forward really is this more constrained and targeted counter cyber operations? What is your perspective kind of um, as looking at the public discourse and the internal communications? Well, this, this is the one that I definitely have to leave to David because unfortunately I do know what it means and I'm not able to talk about it. <laughs> and, and this is part of the problem, right? In this domain is that we overclassify way too much and, and a lot of things that should not be classified, uh, frankly, get a classification slapped on it. And we're not able to have a public debate on, on a lot of these key concepts. But uh, David has reported sure. uh, well on this and he's not limited to by classification uh, uh, rules. Well, um, uh, Dimitri's made my first journalistic argument, which is there's way too much classified in the government generally, but way, way, way too much in cyber. And I, would, I have long argued that, in fact, part of the reason our deterrent isn't working is our fixation with classification. That if we were a little more transparent about what attacks were coming in, how we were responding and so forth, you know, the key to deterrence is letting people have at least some guesswork that you're gonna come back at them. 
and you know it's the it's the it's the old scene um you know in the in the doomsday movies uh where uh, basically you can't be hiding uh what it is you're doing think of that scene in dr strange love where you know if no one knows about the gadget what use is it right um so um so i would make a, an argument that the classification is is actually harming us and we would do a lot better by explaining defend forward, even if you're leaving some ambiguity about how far you're going to go push it. Um, to the specific interesting case of um, putting code in the Russian grid. So first of all, this operation had its origins back in the Obama years, although by the time we wrote about it in 2018, we were right in the middle of the, of the, the Trump camp uh, uh, years. Um, second, there was no real effort to go hide some of the code. They wanted the Russians to see this. They wanted the Russians to see this because the United States had publicly announced through DHS that there was Russian origin code sitting in the US grid. And they wanted to make the point that there was real deterrence here. And if you bring down Cincinnati, we can bring down uh, you know, Leningrad, whatever it is that they wanted to to do in the, in the way signaling seemed to be part of it. And of course, if you're showing somebody that there is seen code in your grid, it raises the question for them, what's the unseen part in the grid as well? Um, there was no objection that we heard within the Trump administration about our publishing the story. We, you know, frequently, if we've got a sensitive story, we will go to the US government and we'll say, look, the final decision's ours, but if you've got a national security case to be made that we're telling an adversary something they don't already know, please make it. But in this case, here's the code, you know? So, and it was made for them to see. And they came back and said they had no problem. Unfortunately, no one briefed the president on that. <laughs> I suspect because they didn't want to tell him that they were doing operations against the Russians for some reason, but that's pure suspicion on my part. So the day the story came, the night the story came out, it was a Saturday night. I remember sitting at the dinner table and seeing this. Uh, I get a phone call saying the president's tweeting about you guys. And he uh, uh, had tweeted out that the New York Times had committed a virtual act of treason by revealing this story. I guess someone may have mentioned to him that he seemed to be confirming the story because about a half hour later, we get another tweet from the president in all caps, those were always my favorites, uh, in which he said, and it's not true, leading us to make the point to the White House the next Monday that they had to take pick that if the story was true, then it must have been treason and they should like send us off to the Justice Department. And if it wasn't true, as the president said, then it couldn't be treasonous, but which one was it? And uh, of course, uh, they didn't want to answer. I thought that said everything about the confusion in the Trump administration about what they were trying to accomplish in the way of signaling. So signaling, I'm, I, I am a, I've been on record many times about um, my um, my general dislike of cyber as a signaling tool. So signaling is always an elegant game, um, but quite often we are too elegant by half. And where you get mis misperceptions that lead to inadvertent escalation or you know completely lost signals is the more elegant you get. So what are the signals that work? The signals that work are the ones that are um, easy to perceive, easy to understand. They come with them um, really credible punishment. None of these things are, are characteristics that we see in cyberspace, right? Cyber signals are often difficult to, to find and they are often misattributed or unattributed or attributed after months and months and months. Um, and generally the threat, what's going to happen after cyber operations is, not super easy to convey, which makes me wonder, and I think this is a really good question for David and Dimitri, what are the role of, of private actors in amplifying signaling campaigns, in making signaling campaigns more effective, or in creating misperceptions about signaling campaigns? So I think that I think the New York Times is probably the number one um, identifier of signaling campaigns. And I, I would say, um, 
I think that's showing up in academics and databases and the empirics that they're building off open sources as well. So I'm interested kind of what is the role of journalism in these signaling campaigns? And then Dimitri, I would like to ask you as the former, um, the, you know, your former role at CrowdStrike, um, increasingly these private sector companies are lending or, lending or, or producing the first uh, evidence of attribution. And so it's no longer kind of the monopoly of the state to determine when they want to attribute and how. So I'm interested from your perspective, kind of what is the role of, the, of companies like CrowdStrike or Recorded Futures um, and in, in whether signaling is occurring, occurring effectively uh, in cyberspace? Well, this is a great question. I'll take the journalism side, but the two are interrelated because if you call up the NSA and say, do you see code of an incoming you know, attack from X country? A, they wouldn't tell you. And B, as we've learned in the case of SolarWinds and Microsoft, the Microsoft Exchange system, they may not be the first to see. They may not even be the second or third to see. So journalistically, we treat this the way we treat um, military operations, military signaling, in the non-cyber world. If the United States runs a um, B-2 bomber out of the US and flies it just south of the DMZ across the Korean peninsula to make the point to Kim Jong-un that at any time we wanted to, we could drop a nuclear weapon in North Korea, that's signaling. And we write about it. Now, some, we have some readers who confuse our role with the government's role and saying, by writing about this, you're doing something aggressive and military and amplifying it, so you shouldn't mention it. And my answer to that is, I'm sorry, it's news if the United States government decides to openly send a signal to Kim Jong-un by flying a B-2 just south of his border. The definition of news. Similarly, this week, we ran military operations, uh, military simulations and, and what President Trump used to call war games in South Korea. And the North Koreans launched off two sets of short range missiles. That was signaling on both sides and we wrote about it. And we would do the same in the cyber realm. Now, the concern is that because signals can get misinterpreted by the adversary, they could also get misinterpreted by us. And we might be sending too much of a signal, too small of a signal. And we're, we try to be as careful with our language as we can be, but there is definitely an echo effect there. Um, the solution to this can't be that we don't publish the news, right? That's not sort of where our, our role is. We do then learn how to trust or, or which of the private sector groups to go trust. Dimitri's group when he was at CrowdStrike was superb, right? And proved that in the DNC case and had the attribution right and had it months ahead of the US government. Um, Microsoft's group, is extremely good. And you'll see them quote, recorded future who you mentioned there is very good and had some really interesting findings the other day about Chinese attacks that may have been signaling um, on the Indian grid, right? So um, is all of this 100% science? No, because attribution is art uh, as well. Uh, but um, there's definitely an echo effect here between the private sector and the media. Well, let me make uh, kind of three, three points here. Um, one is this amazing paradox we have where unquestionably the United States and our Five Eyes allies have the best capabilities in offense, uh, far exceeding anything that the Russians or Chinese or certainly any of the others bring to bear. And yet we have not figured out how to use them effectively outside of the intelligence sphere. Uh, sphere. Certainly when it comes to SIGINT, um, both traditional and, and 
in cybersphere, we're as good as it comes and, and we're able to produce incredible amounts of intelligence that ends up in the presidential daily brief um, that comes from, from those types of operations. But when it comes to using cyber from an offensive perspective to achieve our national objectives, we're really bad at it. And in fact, uh, we constrain cyber command to a great degree. The Trump administration, as, as David has written, uh, has relaxed some of those rules, uh, although there's now a debate of whether we put um, some constraints on this once again. But when you just look at what Russia is able to do, um, both vis-a-vis -vis us, but all, uh, you know, in terms of interfering in our elections, try to achieve an effect or um, the coercion that they've uh, put on Ukraine uh, to really uh, show to the Ukrainian people how vulnerable they are, that they can uh, turn off their power at any given moment in time, they can do um, interference in their election, they can destroy their businesses and the like. Um, when you look at North Korea, how they're able to use cyber to finance the regime, to finance their nuclear program and missile programs by conducting uh, campaigns that um, um, uh, break into banks and steal money and, and break into cryptocurrency exchanges and still still bitcoins and the like. Um, um, China has used this, of course, for 20 years to, in fact, wage economic warfare against us and steal our intellectual property, as we, we well know. And yet we have not figured out how do we use this capability to achieve our priorities and, and our objectives um, outside of just pure collecting of intelligence that um, you know, policymakers can read about and, and try to understand what the adversaries are doing. So that's number one. Number two, on, on the signal and peace, this is actually not new, right? Uh, virtually every single attack that we've seen in the last 20 years has been attributed by the private sector long before it's been attributed by the government. And even the two um, uh, major attacks that we've talked about for the last couple of months, the SolarWinds attacks um, and, and the exchange server attacks, to this day have not really been attributed by the government. Certainly on, on the exchange hacks, they have not come out and said anything about attribution. Microsoft attributed this to Chinese-based groups. Um, and on SolarWinds, they put out, uh, and that was back during the last days of the Trump administration, and a weak attribution that this has a nexus to Russia without talking about any specifics of was it state sponsored, was it was it a particular intelligence agency, and the press and, and the private sector has attributed it much more specifically. So um, we, we're still in this dynamic where the private sector is driving much of the discussion. And it is interesting to see how um, that private sector attribution is now being taken as fact. No one is questioning whether Hafnium attacks were Chinese, no one is questioning whether the SolarWinds hacks were Russia, even though the US government has not stepped in and, and provided public attribution. Um, and, and it kind of shows how relevant they've become, frankly, on, on the attribution question. No one is, is waiting around uh, saying, when, when are they going to come out with attribution? Because frankly, it doesn't even matter at this point um, to, to, to a great extent. Um, and the last point I'll just make on, on the response piece, um, which I think ties into it. Um, and David talked about the seen and unseen uh, term that the Obama administration used, of course, after the DNC hack. And they're, they're using this again now with, with solar winds uh, and potential response there. And for the life of me, I do not understand this. Um, I do, uh, the, the unseen part in particular. Why in the world would you ever execute an operation that, let's say, Vladimir Putin would know about, but you're going to keep hidden from the American people? Um, and I think they need to be pushed on that and pushed on that pretty hard, because if you're going to do something and the adversary is going to know, then come straight with the public, with the taxpayers about what exactly you're doing. Or, um, as is often the case um, and has been the case in the past, the unseen part never happens. Um, and it's just their way of looking tough and, and making it seem like something is going to happen. And, and it really is an excuse to, to not respond at all. Um, and, and I think we need to have a lot more discussion on these issues. Hey, Dimitri, if I can just jump in on that, I have pressed U.S. officials on this uh, because they've been making the scene an unseen case. And let me tell you what it is they say. I'm not tell I'm not by conveying this, endorsing the view. I'm in my reporter role telling you what they tell me. OK, the first is that if you do it in a scene way, then for Putin, it becomes an issue of his manhood and he's got to escalate right, because he's been publicly embarrassed versus privately embarrassed. Um, I, 
I, my own view is Vladimir Putin is unembarrassable. I didn't see him apologizing for the fact that he owned that spectacular house that the Navalny group, you know, revealed the satellite photographs of, um, which I would suggest our next Hoover conference be, be conducted there because it looked like he had plenty of room in the ballroom to accommodate all of us, even if we are socially distanced. Um, uh, the second argument, uh, that they make is that um, you can, by keeping it unseen, you can limit the, you know, and calibrate your deterrence. Again, I would argue if you're going to go after the Russians like this, you want the Chinese and the Iranians and the North Koreans to see it. And their answer is, well, don't worry about it. I'm sure the Chinese will see it right, because they're white, right, and so forth and so on. I'm with you. I don't see the purpose here. I think it's stepping on our own deterrent. Yeah, I would agree. And I would say, I think there's some really great work um, in academia by like Austin Carson and Mike Poznanski um, that look at covert action, not necessarily in cyberspace, and say, is it, does it have the potential of being a credible signal if you pair those with um, private discussions between the heads of state? So if you, you know, put malware in the Russian grid and then you call uh, Putin and say, hey, we did it. Um, and so he argues that that's the only, that's, you know, the primary mechanism by which those kinds of activities can be a deterrent. Um, but I will say in my war games, these, these cyber signals are almost always not perceived. <laughs> And they are almost always um, uh, downplayed. So the tendency seems to be um, to just ignore the cyber thing. Um, and, and so that, which makes it a great tool to conduct without fear of escalation, but also means it's just not really a very effective signaling tool. Um, that said, I see a lot of impetus within the government to try and have it both ways and to be able to signal effectively and conduct defend forward. Um, and I think there's a logical inconsistency there, which is why I have advocated that the US needs to have declaratory restraint and declare that it is not going to use cyber attacks to attack critical infrastructure, at least not as a first attack, um, which I think could um, set some appropriate norms. And I think both of you have worked and thought about what are the appropriate behaviors and norms that we need to have in cyberspace? So I'd love to hear your thoughts about, you know, especially as we move into the next cyber strategy under Biden, what are appropriate norms in cyberspace and what can the U.S. do to build those norms? Well, I'll, I'll give you um, my short list. Um, I agree with you. If we were all to sit down now and, you know, over a beer, try to put together a list of things we thought should be off limits, they would probably be things that affect civilian populations in non war time, much like the Geneva Conventions are designed to do that. And that's why I, I kind of like Brad Smith, Microsoft's concept of the digital Geneva Convention. So we probably say, power grid should be off limits. Election systems, after Dimitri's work, I'd say there'd probably be a lot of people who would argue for election systems to be off limits. Um, I think where the administration would probably like to go after solar winds is that um, fundamental code updates, um, things that you use for your own cybersecurity are sort of like not bombing the ambulances, right? That you're you're trying to make sure that um, that uh, you can have a secure, broad system that you don't do attacks that are so indiscriminate that they call into question the system itself. I think the first obstacle to this is going to be us, right? Because when they hold the the you know super classified meeting on this, somebody's going to say, you know not go after a um, power grid? Well, how about Nitro Zeus, which was the code name for the US program to take out the Iranian power grid if we got into a conflict with, with Iran? The theory being that you might not have to bomb Iran and therefore it would be more humane to take out the, the grid even if people died who were in hospitals or nursing homes or something like that. Election systems, 
Who wants to deny a future president the chance to stop a Maduro-like figure from taking office, right? Um, so I think that you're going to see some objections inside the U.S. government, maybe less so in the Biden government than you would have seen in the Trump government. But I still think you'll see some of that resistance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the challenge that we face with cyber is, is not establishing norms, right? There, there's been an effort uh, within the UN, the, the group of governmental experts that has been working on, on uh, establishing norms for, um, I think, over a decade now. Um, and with the Chinese and the Russians have not come to really much of an agreement, although there's a uh, broader group of 190 nations that just uh, put together a report that um, puts together some very, very basic norms that they got everyone to agree to. But the challenge is not deciding uh, where the red lines are, the challenge is enforcing them. And the problem that we have had in the cyber domain, and I, I, I think still have in the cyber domain, is that we don't actually, at the end of the day, care that much about cyber. That's the brutal reality of the national security process. Uh, when you face problems like, let's say, Russian election interference in 2016, and when this was raised to President Obama, uh, we know what happened. He decided not to respond for lots of reasons, including uh, then Secretary of State Kerry telling him that this is not as important as uh, trying to get a ceasefire with, with the Russians in Syria, uh, which we also ultimately, of course, did not get, and, and a whole slew of other things. And, and that is a problem that anytime we confront cyber issues with four of our primary actors, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, there are always things that take higher priority. You know, with Russia, it may be uh, nuclear arms control, it could be Ukraine, it could be Syria, it could be use of chemical weapons. With Iran, it's the nuclear program, with the North Koreans, it's the missile and nuclear programs again, and so forth. And, um, and by the way, I'm not even arguing that cyber should be more important than, than any of those things. Uh, perhaps we have it exactly right, but we shouldn't perhaps then hypocritically complain so much uh, that um, this is happening to us in cyber because we can't stomach actually responding and putting um, the, the response at a higher priority than um, those other issues that we, uh, we face with those nation states. I want to ask both of you, because right, we're, we're coming near to the end of our discussion. Um, how do we know, how can we understand when the US's cyber strategy is effective or not. Um, this has been something um, I helped advise the Cyberspace Slayer Commission. We really struggled with like, how do we think about measures of effectiveness? So how will we know that what we're doing in what the US is doing in cyberspace is effective or not? I'm not sure we'll ever know. I mean, you would hope that there's sort of a Potter Stewart version of this. Uh, where he said about pornography, you'll know it when you see it, right? Uh, and that in this case, that we would see an absence of activity and attribute that to something we did. So far, we haven't been that convinced, right? I mean, after the, the 2016 um, election interference, President Obama threw 35 um, uh, diplomats, they were mostly spies, out of the country and took a couple of other sets of actions, including sanctions. And some people argue that as a result, the Russians didn't do anything all that serious in the 2020 election. We also went after in 2018, the Internet Research Agency and, and uh, uh, sent some text messages to individual cyber actors and so forth. Um, yeah, they did not, they, they ramped up the, the information warfare, they ramped down the specific attacks on infrastructure. And then we discovered they did solar winds because we were all looking at the, at the election infrastructure and they had an opportunity outside of the election arena. I'm not sure I would rank that to be a great success. You're not gonna get an elimination of activity here. I think the best you can hope for is a reduction in the acceleration that we've seen in the past 10 years and some understanding of the rules and the red lines. And that probably will require somebody stepping over a red line and getting whacked in some big way at some point. 
because people are going to, if you've got red lines, people are going to try to figure out how do you walk right up to it. You know, part of the problem in creating cyber command, and it's both a, an advantage and a problem, is that at the end of the day, it's a military organization. So a lot of the effort that is spent on offensive cyber uh, capabilities development is done in support of uh, military forces and in support of potential future military operations. So I think, should we see a conflict um, in the future with, with a major power, uh, you will see in, incredible capabilities being brought to bear from a cyber perspective by US military. They're very deeply inter inter integrated with a kinetic action. And, and I think we would all sit back and say, oh my God, uh, we, we had no idea that they had the, the capability to do something like this. And, and this is really incredible. Um, we, we saw a little bit of a preview of that, although a lot of it still remains classified um, against the ISIS campaign in Syria. But the challenge, of course, that we faced is that uh, it was not a target-rich environment from a cyber perspective uh, going after ISIS. So, so the number of targets was limited, and uh, it was mostly in support of um, um, drone strikes on, 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 on the terrorist groups themselves and, and using cyber to gain intelligence and to um, generate some effects on the ground that, that would facilitate that. Um, but uh, what we're not good at is outside of a military conflict, when we're not using kinetic force and we're trying to do some of these influence operations and generate some of these effects that are below the level of kinetic conflict, we have no idea how to do that. We are organizationally not set up well for it. And um, uh, we're not simply as creative as our adversaries in, 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 in determining how we would actually do something that actually you know, changes behavior. And as David pointed out, sending text messages to a bunch of operators doesn't generate anything but laughter on the other side about the weakness of, of the US. So um, at some level, this is an organizational issue. Um, you know, I, I would have preferred to see CIA much more engaged um, on the offensive front um, in, in, in trying to shape effects outside of a military conflict. Um, and perhaps we will see that going forward. Well, I think we're now at the point where we have more um, really interesting questions and we have time. So this moves us to what I call the lightning round, which is where I ask very um, complicated <laughs> questions, require a lot of nuance, and ask you to answer these questions rather quickly. Um, that's my nice way of saying please very quickly. Um, so first question, Cyber Pearl Harbor, useful analogy or not? Absolutely not. not. To, yeah, yeah. No. I would agree. It's not. It's not terribly useful. Um, you you heard our former uh, Secretary of uh, Defense use that uh, a number of times, mostly to get Congress's attention yes. and funding. And it was first coined uh, thirty years ago now. So almost half of the way uh, from, from the real Pearl Harbor and we, we still have not seen it. So it's time to put it to bed. All right, cyber war or cyber as an intelligence contest? Neither for me. Um, I don't like the use of the word cyber war and I'm, I'm forever cutting it out of copy and headlines. Um, <laughs> I prefer cyber conflict because I don't think we've seen a full on cyber war. Again, you'll know it when you see it but we are seeing day-to-day -day cyber conflict and some of it is not intelligence gathering. We don't know to this day if solar winds was just about uh, espionage or whether it was about making future use of holes that were placed in the system. Completely agree. And, and I would perhaps even drop cyber from it. We are in conflict with Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Cyber is just one element of that conflict that takes many different dimensions, including in the physical space, including in the economic sphere, um, and of course in cyber. Cyber signaling, useful or not? My view would be whether it's useful or not, it's always gonna happen because it's, it's the, the president's choice between going out and doing something all out that may bring in a response and sitting around doing nothing. So you know, it has become the new economic sanctions. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would slightly tailor a response and say that signaling obviously is really, really important. And you always want to start with the objective of what are you trying to achieve and then pick the right tool for the job. And we should not uh, jump into the cyber toolbox every single time we want to signal. Um, if it's the right tool for the effects we're trying to achieve, sure. Uh, 
uh, but uh, but let's focus on on the on the objective. All right, CISA or the Cyber National Mission Forces (CNMF). What's the better investment? Well, both. Uh, they have very different missions. Uh, CNMF uh, has an objective of protecting first and foremost the DoD itself, which is very much needed um, because uh, we continue to find foreign threat actors on those networks. Um, and uh, obviously that's very disturbing from an espionage perspective, but if there's a conflict and they're able to uh, impact our ability to project forces uh, downrange, um, that would be a disaster. Um, CISA, I've argued, should become the CISO, um, the Chief Information Security Officer of the civilian federal government. They should give, be given the authority to protect um, uh, all of the 137 different executive agencies that we have, DOD and the intelligence community aside. Um, and um, we're slowly but surely moving in that direction. I would agree with that. I would think about them in different terms. Um, the Cyber National Mission Force, because it's got an offensive you know, element to it, is the um, deterrent by punishment side, and CISA is the deterrent by resilience side, right? The goal for CISA is to create enough resilience in the US government and if it can in state governments and if you can by advice, uh, the private sector to make an adversary think, ah, it's not worth the trouble. You know, Dimitri has sold them enough defenses that it, they'll be able to bounce right back. Well, see that, so if I'm a stakeholder for CNMF or CISA, I'm really happy with these arguments because these this is gonna go well at Congress. We'll cut other stuff. Not these guys. Okay, cyber deterrence, is it dead? Yep. Dead, I'm not even sure it's alive yet. Yeah, go right <laughs> ahead, Dimitri. <laughs> no, I mean, there's no such thing as cyber deterrence. There's deterrence. And, um, you know, it's really, really hard to deter acts that are below um, uh, the threshold of, of war, uh, whether it's in the physical space or in, uh, frankly, in, uh, um, in, um, in cyberspace. I mean, we're, we're seeing... Uh, uh, we've been seeing for many years the Iranians attack and kill our forces in Iraq, um, and we, we had not responded for many years until, uh, until the hit on Soleimani for that. So we've, we've, we always struggle with deterrence uh, when, it, when it is below that threshold, and cyber is just uh, one aspect of it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the hardest thing with deterrence is proving that it worked, first to yourself and then to everybody else. Final question. The mo who do you believe has been the most influential character in the development of US cyber strategy? I'm gonna say Dimitri and because I can't think of anybody else. Well, I, I think uh, General Alexander, Keith Alexander um, has um, obviously been instrumental in creating cyber command and establishing many of the paradigms we now have. Um, on, on the military side and, and having led NSA for, I think, eight years, um, uh, transformed that agency from a traditional SIGIN agency into uh, an agency that's very forward leaning on cyber. So I, I would say probably Keith. Uh, I would agree. I think the problem with uh, government uh, approaches to all of this is there are so many cooks in the kitchen that you'll never really know, you know, who had the most influence at any given moment. But I, I would say Keith Alexander early on, I would say General Nakasone has had a very influential move in the direction that you've just been writing about, which is defend forward persistent engagement. Um, what's unproven is whether what he's trying is actually having the effects of, that he intended. And by the way, I give Keith credit for Nakasone because he was his protege, as was Ann Neuberger, who is now in the Deputy National Security Advisor for, for Cyber Role. So in fact, he's got his fingers everywhere in, 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 in the face of his protégés. And you know, if Ann Neuberger can make this work with um, uh, solar winds and with the exchange element of it and with the executive orders and all that, a year from now, we might be saying that she's the answer to your question. Well, no matter what, it seems like a book will have to be written at some point about all of the inner workings about how US and DOD cyber strategy were developed. I wanna thank you both for today. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Really appreciate it.
And then for all of those of you who have joined us uh, over the last few months, thank you so much. Don't forget the book 10 Years In is actually downloadable and free because it was published by the US government. So um, please enjoy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.